Hello. Hello. Um, I'm going to try and do this really quickly because we're running slightly over time and you probably all would really like a glass of wine or something. Um, so I'm going to try and answer this question. Um, I'm going to do it from two different perspectives. I'm going to do it from the perspective of the UK subsidised arts sector, because that's the sector I know uh, most well. And then I'm also going to look at it from a kind of much wider global position. And I'll explain what I mean by both of those things. So in the UK, we've had uh, a kind of cultural policy arts subsidy mechanism for 72 years since the Arts Council was set up in 1946. And recently, for the past 10 years or so, we've also had huge amounts of data about cultural consumption. And that has led us to a point of very significant crisis. And some people might articulate that as a point of failure. Part of the issue with that, part of the problem that we have in the subsidised cultural sector in the UK, looks pretty much like all of you, actually. OK. It looks like you're all lovely and pretty gorgeous, don't get me wrong. Um, but you're also, I suspect, predominantly white, middle class, university educated. And not, not all of you, I'm not painting with that broader brush. <laughs> and you are typical arts consumers, and this is a problem if we look at cultural consumption uh, of publicly funded art uh, through a democratic lens. The other issue that we've got is that on a global level, we live in quite terrifying times. We've seen levels of human migration on a level not seen since the Bible. We have rapid technological change, which is making us question our identities, our social interactions, what happens with our data. And the convergence of these two kinds of themes brings us to consider again in more depth issues around social justice, around the public sphere, around the role of arts and culture uh, in society. So if I'm going to try and answer this question, uh, I could do a really short presentation because the answer to this question is no. Okay. Um, that shouldn't be a surprise for anybody in this room uh, who is familiar with any kind of data on cultural consumption whatsoever. Okay, we recognise it's a problem, so what are we going to do about it? So what I want to do today is think more about this question. Can the museum be a democratic institution? And I want to try and answer that question by giving you some ideas giving you some potentially different ways of thinking about how we might address this question um, and just give you some concepts, some from cultural policy and academia, uh, some from uh, further afield. So I just want to make a kind of note first about uh, institutions. Okay, Institutions are beautiful. Uh, I love institutions. This is an institution. I wish my house looked like this. I wish my house was an institution because then it would be beautiful and full of art as well. Um, and institutions have two slightly different definitions. Okay, An institution could be an organisation founded for religious, educational, professional or social purpose. That in many ways sums up an awful lot of museums without even mentioning art and culture. But part of the other definition of an institution is an established law or practice. And what I want to suggest to you initially is that actually museums and uh, all arts and cultural organisations to a greater extent work across these two meanings of institution. And perhaps it's the laws and practices of museums as institutions that are part of the problem in terms of why we don't have a broader, more democratic audience for them. So, anybody who's worked in the art sector for quite a long time, like I have, um, I'm probably on like my third crisis in the art sector now. Um, these things come around. We get influxes of new people coming into the sector. Uh, my, my God, what are we going to do about this? This cultural consumption and these statistics about diversity and inclusion and disability and so on is terrible. And then people who are second or third generation be like, yeah, we, we've had a career. I remember that crisis back in 1992. That was a crisis. Um, so we have this strange phenomenon in the art sector where the crisis is both constant, perpetual and endlessly new all the time. And I think part of that problem, and I'm somebody who's spent a huge amount of time looking at the history of cultural policy, part of the problem is now 
we can start to think about why things haven't changed. And we can think about why they're not changing fast enough and they think about things that we might do to make that change uh, work more quickly. So picking up a comment that was made at the start of the conference, I'm going to try and answer some of these questions by thinking about who isn't in this room right now and start to give you some perspectives from outside uh, the cultural sector. Because what's interesting about cultural institutions like museums is that they sit at the intersection of lots of different social themes and social histories and social narratives. This clicky thing is not the best one in the world. Ah, there we go. Um, and so what we've seen in the States recently, for example, is a number of high profile sackings of women who work in museums. It's not exclusive to the States, it's happened at the RSC in the UK as well. We start to see boards and governance of organisations responding to this crisis responding to these issues, uh, in this case, by being quite reactionary and reverting to type and becoming more conservative and not wanting to experiment uh, with new ideas. This is a quote from one of the uh, female museum leaders who was uh, asked to leave, shall we say. Uh, the museum, the Western institution I've dedicated my life to with its familiar humanist offerings of knowledge and patrimony in the name of empathy and education is one of the greatest holdouts of the colonialist enterprise. Does anybody disagree with that? Put your hand up. One person at the back, okay. We'll talk later. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, this phrase is from a young lady called Alice Proctor, who runs a really fascinating initiative called Uncomfortable Art Tours. She's a PhD student at University in London, uh, and this is her phrase. And she says, I make display it like you stole it badges for people to wear on the tours. It's a slogan designed to push museums and visitors to rethink the politics of presentation in galleries. On most text panels, there's little or no mention of how objects came to be there. The euphemistic language of acquisition obscures the truth. Um, I'm going to give you another quote. This is Dr. Jeanette Cole, uh, who works in the museum sector uh, in America. And I absolutely love this quote. Forgive me while I read these out. I've not quite got the skills to memorise them all. Um, Diversity is when the full range of diverse human beings are invited to the party. Equity is when all the invitations say the same thing. Accessibility is when the invite can be understood by everyone. And inclusion is when all at the party are asked to dance. I think that's quite beautiful. Um, so, are there any dead French sociologists in the room? No, excellent. Uh, so this is Pierre Bourdieu. Um, Bourdieu came up with the ideas of social capital and cultural capital, which are everywhere in every museum, whether we see them or not. Uh, and Bourdieu said, the most important forms of domination are not only economic, but also intellectual and pedagogical and lie on the side of belief and persuasion. That's why one must speak out to restore a sense of utopian possibility. And what I want to try and get to today in this presentation is how we might speak out, how we might restore this sense um, of utopian possibility and begin to think anew about some of these definitions. I want to give you this idea of normative misperception. It's not from the arts, it's a psychological term. I was, I was really guilty of this. I worked for 20 years in arts marketing and communications. A normative misperception is the condition where because we do something, we think everybody else does it as well, okay? When I first started my marketing and communications career in the arts, I marketed to me and my friends. It was my default setting. My language, my choice of images, my design concepts were designed to make me want to go to the thing that I was marketing because I had the normative misperception of thinking that everyone was like me. And I was right in a way because they were all like me, but my job was to address the fact that they were all like me and to try and make them different. So marketing just to myself was never gonna quite achieve that. Um, another issue that we're dealing with, I had a bet with somebody that I would put Beyonce in every conference presentation that I did uh, during the course of a year. Um, I love Beyonce, so it's not difficult. Um, one of the challenges of the intellectual tradition um, of public subsidy in a simple sense was that we use 
the state intervention with public subsidy to create goods that can't be made in the market alone. Okay, so we all understand that all customers just can't work in the market without subsidy and so on because of their business models. Um, but one of the other ideas in that was that the mass markets and popular culture couldn't produce work that was as good as the work that was subsidised. And this forced contradiction between high art and popular culture, which is a very problematic issue. But I want to suggest, and again, it's just an idea, um, that a lot of the work that's being produced in the market now, and I think also Kendrick Lamar winning the uh, Nobel Prize recently as well, is that there's incredibly amazing art being produced in the market. It's incredibly amazing art that's politically and socially engaged and has a reach far beyond much of the art that's created through public subsidy. So maybe we need to rethink some of these intellectual traditions in terms of how we're approaching the idea of the democratic function uh, of the arts. Now, having said all of that, um, it is the vanity of every age to consider itself in crisis. So we can be vain and we can consider ourselves in crisis. But we can also look at the history of cultural policy and we can look at the history of museums and we can look at the history of arts marketing and communications and think, actually, there are things we can do to address this, there's things we can do to work around it. Um, and you're probably familiar with this quote. Uh, it's from Audre Lorde. It's not, women are powerful and dangerous. So I just really like that picture. Um, it's this quote. It's Audre Lorde said, for the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. They may allow us to temporarily beat him at his own game, but they will never enable us to bring about genuine change. And I worked, I ran the National Audience Development Agency for Northern Ireland for seven years. And it's my feeling that a lot of the tools that we use to try and engage and diversify audiences are actually the master's tools. The tools that won't work because they're tools that arise out of the institution rather than arising out of the people that we're trying to engage. And maybe if we think about how we would get these tools and think about them differently, uh, we might have some more success. I want to also just mention this term, um, hyper-instrumentalism, because it, this is a slightly... Um, slightly obscure academic -y thing, but I suspect it's going to become increasingly important for everybody. Um, 30 years ago in the UK, cultural organisations, cultural institutions and museums were really resistant to the idea of being seen to have economic impact. They were really resistant to the idea of being drivers for tourism. They were really resistant to the idea of culturally led regeneration and all the things now that we talk about the arts being good for like reducing crime and education and literacy and uh, combating loneliness and so on. Whereas now lots of arts organisations actually champion the fact that they can achieve those things. They champion their instrumental effects because they see that as a good way of aligning with wider government strategies. What's happened in Northern Ireland particularly, and I suspect maybe about to happen elsewhere, is that that kind of instrumentalist approach has become hyper-instrumental. And what I mean by that is the government in Northern Ireland decided that rather than looking at publicly funding cultural organisations and then working out what those organisations could do for society, they decided to look at the outputs first and then decide which cultural organisations they would fund based on their ability to deliver those outputs. What that essentially means is that if you decide that you want to target uh, underprivileged children in North Belfast, you'll stop funding the orchestra because the orchestra is not the best mechanism for doing that. Uh, and what happens in a hyper-instrumental approach is that questions of cultural value and quality disappear, because you don't need good art to achieve those social outcomes. You just need whatever best achieves those social outcomes. Uh, so that's a, a trend that I think is coming from academia, but something that I think is going to happen much more widely. Um, so right, let me get back to the question. Um, if we think that the museum isn't a democratic institution, then we have to start asking ourselves, right, why and how should art and culture be both democratic and democratised? Okay. So this is from a guy called Kevin Mulcahy, who's a, a brilliant cultural policy academic who works in the States. Now, the democratic state cannot be seen as simply indulging the aesthetic preferences of a few, however enlightened. He wrote this two decades ago. I think he could have written it yesterday, 
Equally, he could have written it four decades ago, let's be fair. Um, but the pace, the pace of change that we're seeing isn't sufficient given the context that I um, outlined at the start, both globally uh, and in terms of the history of, of uh, the subsidised arts sector. We need to see things changing. So I just want to, I'm going to close with just giving you this framework because there have been two conferences in the UK already this year about cultural democracy and there have been a number of reports that have been issued both from within this building and within the European Commission um, and more widely. And I want to give you a kind of framework to think about, which is these two ideas, okay? An awful lot of what we do in the sector is about the democratisation of culture, okay? It's about a predefined idea of what culture is, culture with a capital C, that we then take out and we democratise. We do education and outreach and audience development, and we do, if you're a theatre, you go and do rural touring, etc., etc. A different idea is cultural democracy. I know they sound really similar, but they're completely different things. Okay, democratisation of culture is a top-down model. Cultural democracy is a bottom-up model to enable a more kind of democratic uh, cultural base. So we are all, with it, whether we realise it or not, familiar with the policy model of the democratisation of culture because we live in it uh, all the time. So this is where institutions kind of come back in because we have an official culture typically very large, well-funded institutions whose job it is to democratise culture. Now, to go back with what I said earlier in terms of the 72 years uh, that we've had in the UK, that's 72 years of the democratisation of culture. It's 72 years of democratisation of culture that people stubbornly refuse to engage with in sufficiently large numbers. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Cultural democracy, in a really simple nutshell, uh, is about giving the validity and the cultural value to people's choices of forms of expression and engagement. This is enormously difficult for institutions like museums and galleries and concert halls and opera houses and so on, because it's predicated on intellectual traditions about the supremacy of the artist, about the artist's muse, the artist's tradition, the artistic director, the role of art and the role of the artist within the organisation. And it presents a challenge to that, because what it's asking is to put people at the heart of the organisation and supplant that tradition. Um, there's a huge amount of work on this, but I've uh, given it quite a simple uh, expression. Um, and sorry for the amount of text on the slide, but I just wanted to give you some uh, kind of outline bullet points of what cultural democracy um, looks like. I will bet you 10 euros um, that within the next 12 months, if you're still working in the sector and you have any engagement with policymakers or politicians or contact with Europe, you're going to start hearing cultural democracy much more because it's starting to be seen as a way of articulating ideas around civic engagement and social justice and cultural participation that simply move away from the old models uh, and the old ways of thinking. So I want to close just by saying I think, I genuinely think cultural democracy, one, it doesn't involve getting rid of institutions, but what it does do is offer a new and much more hopeful way of articulating and thinking about so many of the problems that are causing these perpetual crises in the arts sector. So it's up to you, really. You're the ones who run the institutions, I don't. Uh, so please do something about it. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.